This presentation is brought to you by the SDG Decision Education Center. I would now like to introduce today's moderator, Dr. Eric Bickle of the University of Texas at Austin. Eric teaches courses and leads research in decision analysis and its application to business and public policy. He is the academic director of the Strategic Decision and Risk Management Certificate Program, which is a collaboration of SDG and the University of Texas. Eric, you now have the floor. Thank you, Casey. And uh, let me welcome everybody that's joined us uh, today. Carl and I have been looking forward to this webinar uh, for some time. It's a topic near and dear to our hearts. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this is the 40th anniversary of Strategic Decisions Group. Um, hard, hard to believe. And um, to celebrate that milestone, we've been having a series of webinars uh, this year. And there's been some really uh, interesting topics. You can uh, find a, a record of those on the SDG Thought Leadership uh, website. And we'll have at least one more webinar before the end of the year. And I'll say a little bit more about that at the uh, end of the presentation. Um, so without further ado, it, it, it's always uh, a thrill to, to see Carl and get to do these webinars with Carl, uh, Dr. Carl Spetzler. And Carl has over 40 years of experience uh, working with top management and boards of directors, making just the types of decisions that we're gonna be talking about today. Really big bet, capital intensive decisions, uh, many parties involved, uh, and, and and lots of risk. I think really the most complex decisions that we uh, we face within our field. Uh, many of you know Carl, and Carl's also the lead author of the uh, book Decision Quality: Value Creation from Better Business uh, Decisions, and he's the chairman of SDG. So Carl, welcome to today's webinar. Thank you so much, Eric. It's my Eric. pleasure to be here with you. Good, great, great to see you. Um, so before we get started, uh, we thought it would be uh, nice to hear from you, from the participants, and we'd really like to know how familiar you are with, with decision analysis and with decision quality as applied to large capital projects. And so we created this poll, which you should be able to see, and if you would please make a selection uh, here. Um, are you a, a decision professional working on large capital projects? Are you a customer uh, of a, or a team participant in uh, DQ types of projects uh, with large, uh, large capital investment? Or are you um, um, familiar with DQ, but not in the context of large uh, capital projects? Are you in the beginning stages of just learning about it? Or uh, is this topic completely, completely new to you? So if you'd make a, a selection there, and Carl, it'll be interesting to uh, to get some feedback from the the audience. We can see the uh, results coming in, and once they've stabilized, we'll we'll go ahead and share those. Um, you know, Eric, on this topic, uh, we're we're going to be talking about how we embed decision quality into the large capital project environment from the beginning to the end and we talk about uh, ODQ when we bring decision quality to a, a whole enterprise and I'm delighted to see that we have so many decision professionals on the uh, in, in the webinar and uh, people in general have familiarity so I will not spend a lot of time on explaining decision quality, use some of the language. We do have, for those of you that are in the early stages of learning about this, webinars that are available on our website to really go and learn the basics, okay? So uh, I, I think that plus the book gets you a good start, but I'm assuming in general, and I think everybody will get something out of it, that I'm speaking to a an audience that is familiar with the concepts of DA and decision quality. Okay, yeah, I think that's that's fantastic. And it, it looks like almost 40% are really working in the area of large projects. And that's something that Carl and I noticed from the uh, the list of attendees really coming from 
industries and companies that face these types of uh, difficult decisions. Okay, well, why don't we, um, so thank you for doing that. Uh, if we go forward one other slide, we want to get some other feedback uh, from you. And that's really what goes wrong in these types of projects, these large capital investment or capital intensive projects that generally have a lot of uncertainty and risk associated with them. And uh, we've taken a stab here at things that we've seen on the many projects that we've worked on really boils down to what, what goes wrong and, and why. And we'd like to hear from you too. So if, if you um, would like, you could in the question panel, you could submit things that you've seen that have gone wrong uh, in major projects. And you should be able to access that through the, um, uh, the interface here. You can submit a question. And so Carl, things that we've seen a uh, lack of uh, stakeholder participation, cost overruns, unclear objectives, um, projects being delayed, lots of conflicts among the stakeholders, um, ESG issues now becoming quite a bit more uh, important, not having the right incentives, um, difficult technology and and so forth would you like to to add to that and i'll look and see what well, comes into uh, let me just as we go forward here say that uh, many of the root causes are in the decisions that people have made and and how they are made and, and the fact that they haven't reached decision quality in the decisions including the commitment of all the key parties that need to be uh, aligned to fully execute successfully and or they end up being really execution failures and in the world of big projects uh, and, and there are many descriptions of these project delivery processes so the one that I like in particular came out of the book by Fisher uh, integrating project delivery this is more focused on big building projects and airports and things of that sort but it's really all the same, okay? And if at the level we're talking about, a, a big project is one where you have a possibility and you're thinking about what could be, and when you're all done, you have a completed operating transfer project. What goes on in between there is what we call this project delivery process. And, uh, when we take a decision perspective on this, I want to talk about really a couple of different stages. Carl, please. Before you go to let me let me mention a couple of these challenges that came in because I think they really support what you're about to go through here. So, okay. I'm just a sampling. So um, things that can go wrong: inability to change direction on these major projects. I think yes. we've, we've certainly seen that. Perfectly executing the wrong project. Right, that's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, moving targets. A lot of advocacy, having an advocacy type of yeah. bias. A lot of attachment and advocacy again and again. Yeah. Tight deadlines, no clear exit path. Uh, and, and more and more, more and more. There's no shortage of the, the challenges here, but I wanted to highlight those for you. Thank you, thank you, Eric. And, and many of those would be driven by the, the kind of decisions and designs you have, okay? And that's really what this is about. And I, I wanna recognize three different stages of uh, making projects become reality. One is the project initiation decisions. So which projects do we initiate? Then the second, is this project shaping stage where in that project shaping stage we both define the who and the what of the project okay and to a high level how we're going to get it done so the decisions are setting up a whole organization and these projects and let's hypothetically think of it in terms of a, a one billion dollar project so the numbers are easy okay in this project initiation stage, maybe there's 1% of the money being spent, 
in this next stage, often from the total billion dollar project, you might spend between five and 10% getting really ready and being ready to, to now break ground, okay? But the project leadership gets defined, the approaches get defined and the project gets shaped. And then we have lots of decisions that are project execution decisions, okay? And if we think of these three stages of decision-making, and I'm not separating out the actual startup, okay, for a moment uh, in, in this high-level view, but that they continue with the project execution, kind of including a startup phase of, of the project as it gets turned over. Now, I want to go through each of those stages and talk a little bit about the nature of the decisions because we have to understand them to embed decision quality. And throughout this, the user owners, that's, the, that's really the people that gain from the economic value and, and the societal value that might be being produced because many of these projects might be in the public sphere. Okay, as opposed to the, the private sphere, or they could be public-private partnerships and so on. But this user-owner community is, is the, uh, sets the stage and are the decision, highest level decision board or decision community stakeholder group. Okay? And they select the project leadership, and the project leadership then actually is in charge of the execution. And actually designing that project leadership for this new organization that is a temporary organization that you're going to build that probably has tens of thousands of people involved during its life cycle. And people get onboarded and then they get off because we have this succession of trades and activities in a project. That project leadership is the group that's making the decisions and running the project during the execution cycle. So, I also see this as having a professional decision quality support. So if you want to embed decision quality throughout and really make it the equivalent of what we call ODQ in an enterprise as a project ODQ, organizational decision quality, then you need from the beginning to have a set of user owners that want to have decision quality drive the decisions and they install the capability that's an ongoing capability through the project cycle uh, of decision quality support. Now, in the project initiation decision world, uh, it turns out that uh, most organizations that are probably attending this would probably internally already have decision professional competencies and support. And that group, supports the user owners in trying to make a decision on what project should we initiate in terms of getting maximum value potential out of our portfolio of project opportunities. Now, there's a lot of stuff that's gone on before that in generating these opportunities. In fact, some of the opportunities that are in this uh, set in that portfolio are a significant part of the value of an organization, okay? The context in that first set of decisions is it's the owner user's portfolio of opportunities. And usually there's a lead owner that drives this stage. And they have to answer what's the opportunity, what is the value and risk? And throughout, I'm going to talk about value and value driven, but I mean value and risk integrated from the beginning, uncertainties embraced, and we do not talk about single numbers, period. Okay, we just kind of start with ranges and uncertainties and get, embrace uncertainty from the beginning and, and always talk about value and risk potential. The answer, you have to answer kind of who would you want to invite in to participate in this in at the owner user group level and in what way? Will they be partners? Will they be uh, debtors? Okay. Will they be uh, a government agency that in fact is part of it, uh, often countries? 
uh, or uh, energy companies that belong to a country, okay, and so on. How does this opportunity compare to others has to be answered. And what are the major challenges if we proceeded with this? You have a high level risk understanding. And the real question is, should we proceed to shape, shape up this project? Okay. And think of that as a decision professional, as basically having done the value analysis with a focus on total user owner value and risk. And you should get a tornado chart. And in this, notice that there are a lot of factors here, demand factors, regulatory changes, value, optionality, product production cost factors that are really not under the control of the project. Project cost, project completion and performance level, that's kind of the project. So the value, the true total economic and benefit value to the owner user group to be maximized, you're already thinking about that very much in this, should we go forward or not? Because that's the price, that's the potential price. Why would we be doing this anyway, okay? Now, that price can be significantly enhanced in the next stages, but what where we are at that point is we've really got this action to proceed or to put this file of understanding back on the shelf among the many opportunities that we might be considering. And uh, then in general, for most of the big companies that have a whole portfolio of this, they have uh, dozens of these opportunities. And this project evaluation, economic assumptions, and so on, uh, constantly developed and reviewed, uh, that's being done for many opportunities with a few that will proceed, okay? And so the next stage of proceeding probably is driven the most by what mindset people use for contractual and, and relational uh, relational alignment. And there's kind of the extreme of going to contractually binding with controls and tough legal enforcement. It's, it's, it's kind of how we did it in the 80s and 90s. And we had a lot of lawsuits and a lot of, of, of wasted effort going into dealing with the conflicts and on a legalistic basis. Or the opposite extreme is to have a trust relationship based alignment with incentives and the governance process where everybody feels like they own a piece of it. And uh, not, you, you can go either there in terms of rigid and legalistic or adaptive. But in fact, there's a whole continuum of in the middle, maybe trust and verify. The upper corner on the right side is just not available. You can't be both this and that at the same time completely. You can be somewhat in the middle, and this is what integrated project delivery tries to achieve. And I, I want to make, please go ahead. Yeah, the, I think this is an area where a number of the questions are are centered. If uh, with your tornado diagram, yes. you know, who, who's holding the risks? How do we structure? this kind of multi-party decision-making environment to really align incentives and 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 behaviors so a, a number of the the questions I, I are think, on this topic. eric uh i i'm not going to be able to answer in this webinar with the overview of what i'm trying to say uh how we get there but by the end of this project shaping stage we have to have clarity on risk sharing. We have to have, which means we have to have an understanding of the uncertainty because we can slice it and dice it and hold it in different ways, okay? And we can transfer risk, but first we have to assess it and quantify it so that we can do this. This is why one of the reasons why I'm talking it from the beginning, you want to have value and risk being one. 
right? That's, you want to deal with uncertainty explicitly from day one in terms of value. And once you get to project execution, then the risk shifts from the economic kind of risks we have to really being cost and schedule and performance, because that's what the project execution can affect. The, the project shaping decisions are still being made with a focus and a mindset towards total maximum value, increasing the size of the price. But after that, they become cost schedule performance. I've got to have a project that really works to the design specs and I will, and, and performance is seen as then we come in within budget or under budget on time. Okay. That's the, you manage that in, in, a, in, in, in the execution stage. But this, this actually, I agree, it's at the heart of a lot of this. And one caution I want to just say to the attendees, uh, in my experience, people are often better in aligning incentives than aligning behaviors. This really came clear to me in one setting. I, I was working with a, a business unit head of, of a very large technology company and, and speaking with the CEO of that technology company to whom the business unit had uh, reported. And uh, she was one of my favorite clients, the, uh, the business unit head. And uh, <clears throat> the this CEO and I were talking and I was saying, you know, what you really need to align is the incentive structures for your business unit heads with total shareholder value. And uh, he said to me, uh, well, what percent do you think the compensation of our business unit heads uh, is according to the overall corporate shareholder value? Okay, that is through various options and, and so on. And I said, oh, maybe 20%, but I don't know what, he says it's over 70% of their total compensation comes from that. We did that 18 months ago. We restructured this compensation model to really align the incentives. Right? And I said to him, if you did that, you really miss the opportunity to transform behaviors because you you made it incentives only, and certainly the business unit head I'm working with is working as if this had little to do with her personal incentives, okay? So you need to not just change incentives, you need to onboard people and have them deeply understand how their behaviors align with these incentives. If you get that and you get it right, you can get a, people that are members of a project delivery team to feel like being owners in the sense of optimizing the value you're trying to get to. Okay? And so this, this is, uh, you know, ultimately profit sharing arrangements and ownership structures. And so there are lots of tools in the bag that people use in designing this. But the important thing is to have a philosophy and then make sure it gets translated and, and understood at the level of the person that's taking the actions and whose behaviors define the value of the project and coming in on time and so on. And so this is a really big part. And applying decision quality in these project shaping decisions creates immense value. At the end of you, you not only do you define the leadership and contracting approach and so on, you select the concept, you come and you finally get to a point of where you are at the bend of the financial commitment curve. And by that time, you might have spent five to in, in, in a unique project, maybe up to 10% of the total capital. So this is in a billion dollar project, probably something you've spent between 50 and 100 million dollars getting to this point where you now could turn the switch and say, we're going for it. We're going to break ground in six weeks and we'll have a, a groundbreaking ceremony or whatever. Okay. And so the concept's been selected and designed at a high level. Project leadership and governance for decisions in the execution uh, stage are defined. 
Those are all decisions, okay? The contracting relationship and approaches are clear. Primary suppliers have been selected and engaged, and high-level cost schedule estimates are credible by now, and there's financing and risk sharing agreements are at the level where they're ready to design. So this is a lot of decisions, okay, that you've made at that point, okay? And uh, I like Chevron's uh, famous chart. I think it's the bird peak or something like that, they, they call it. But basically, project shaping is this value identification, as they call it here. And the quality of the decisions you make have a huge impact of creating what we call value potential. It's not value in the being realized yet, but it's value potential. So the quality of the what we do here can often double or triple the value of the potential project by how we uh, organize and decide all those uh, key decisions. At that point, when you go to execution, good execution actually delivers on the value potential. Sometimes you can, through execution, actually improve it a little. But it's much more and much easier to degrade the value potential through ex poor execution. Most of the value potential assumes you're going to execute reasonably well. Now, there's, there's always execution risk that we might already include over here. But in general, this, this basic idea that the value potential is primarily set in this project shaping stage. And that's also where, you know, organizations like SDG and internal decision professional groups and so on have probably spent most of their time. Typically more on the concept select and technical side rather than the organizational design kind of decisions, but you want to apply decision quality to all of those key decisions to get maximum value. And they're classic decision quality projects. These are not, they don't require inventing something new. The goal is to reach decision quality. And we have processes that are tried and true for uh, this, like the dialogue decision process, okay? And <clears throat> those projects and decision projects that you have in that uh, are both complex in terms of the analytical complexity and they're complex in terms of organizational complexity. So this is where it's typically the primary home of decision uh, professionals. They spend a lot of their time helping in these project shaping decisions. And when we move to the next stage of project execution, it then is a real shift in how we go about reaching decision quality. Where in the project shaping decisions, you can think of uh, the decision professionals as being the process leaders and, and, and assisting. When you get to the project execution stage, the fact is there are lots of medium size and smaller decisions that in total add up to making a big difference on whether the execution uh, meets the decision, the potential, or degrades it. And that means we have to build it into what we call a healthy decision culture, which means the frontline decision makers, and this may be the supervisory level, this can be all the way up and down the project organization, okay? And they have to be able to apply the principles of decision quality around the table as a checklist and use what we, what we call rapid DQ, identify, judge the six requirements, identify the gaps, find a way to quickly fill the gaps and keep things moving, okay? So that is a shift in the role of the decision professional support, more into training and support and decision agenda management for the project leadership 
uh, also updating and revising the cost and schedule, which is pro probably going to be a probabilistic network analysis. So there's a lot of tools and stuff, but the real action is at the level of the frontline decision makers where they're not likely to have a decision professional in the room when they make most of the project execution decisions. The way you can do that is by embedding it into the culture. Okay? And a, a healthy decision culture is one that achieves organizational congruence by really building decision quality in. And you, you want to, on anybody that get, gets onboarded to the project, they should have at least a day of the equivalent of training of what is decision quality and how do you use it to go make rapid decisions in front of you. So you have a common language and philosophy. You have everybody understanding with clear transparency and line of sight to value that gets on the project. You have a shared understanding of value and value metrics. What are we trying to do and how it translates to behaviors? Okay. And shared objective uh, in terms of highest value and risk delivery, what we're trying to get to. And <clears throat> a healthy decision culture also doesn't tolerate dysfunctional decision behaviors. So you define some of the dysfunctional decision behaviors early on. And you, you basically say they don't occur around here, okay? So you, you don't get to have uh, the, the ability to go and just dominate with an advocated solution if, in fact, there are people that are, have different opinions. If it's before decision, disagreement is fuel. After decision, you want alignment and commit to action, okay? So all that kind of behavior, we've talked about that in some of our other webinars. If you do that right, what you get is what we call uh, <clears throat> organizational congruence. And organizational congruence is basically that the people, the processes, and the culture of an organization are aligned and they become mutually reinforcing. And it's you, you it it takes all those parts to get become congruent. Okay, it's just you can't do it by just fixing processes or just focusing on who we get or something. It, it you have to make all of that work together to be able to create this organizational congruence and a healthy decision culture is central to all of that. Okay, so this is a Building that in, which is a matter of training and alignment and the leadership uh, owning that, is, is a big piece. Now, it's easier to actually do in a project than it is in an enterprise. Okay? If you want to transform a whole enterprise, you, it, it's, it's a much taller order. But in a mega project, you can set the stage from the beginning and you can build it in. And that lead, this decision culture, you really start building at the at, during the shaping decisions, but it pays off the most during the execution phase. Okay? And it, maybe you you've adopted a healthy decision culture at top leadership level during the shaping project shaping decisions. So. If you want to build decision quality in from the beginning and make it central to the equivalent of what we call ODQ, organizational decision quality, in project end-to-end, -end, you want to get started at the beginning, build in this professional decision support because it pays off in a big way. The constant in all of this is meeting the requirements of decision quality. And that's true for the big decisions or the small decisions. I cannot think of a decision where I consciously want to violate the requirements of decision quality. Now, uh, even when I am operating automatically on my, and more out of a decision habit, or like when I'm driving, if I came up and said, systematically, I'm making a mistake, 
I would want to change my decision habits to align with decision quality. Okay, so, so this goes up and down to any size of decision. That's why it is so valuable to make it part of the decision culture and build it in to the frontline decision makers. Now, the uh, approaches for getting this done differ greatly and have to be fit for purpose. Some of them have to be uh, a, a half an hour meeting around the table and that's it. Others have to be, you know, you say, oh, this one is delegated to this person, they're an expert and they can just make it. Uh, others have to be escalated and you want on the on some of the larger shaping decisions, you want a whole DDP process, okay? So uh, there are many approaches to getting to the right choice, but it's getting there to the meeting the requirements of decision quality. Generally speaking, it's not about the efficiency of the decision. It's about getting to the requirements, meeting the requirements, okay? So if you took a little longer or you went a circuitous road, but you got to the right decision, that's good, as opposed to doing a half-assed decision in it, but quickly, okay? Sometimes, especially in Silicon Valley, where uh, I am located, uh, people have now substituted speed for timeliness. It ha making good decisions at speed is great if you have the healthy decision culture embedded because it actually does speed up and it leads to much less recycling. So this making decision quality being the constant and everybody understanding is a big thing and re recognizing that the fit for purpose approach to making these decisions can be significantly different from one to the next and uh, these days many of the organizations are uh, trying to see how do we fit agile in this well agile is not a decision methodology agile is a full management methodology that gets you to results. So it's both decision making and execution in a certain way with collaboration and a rapid iteration and so on. And so you can apply the concepts of decision quality within Agile to make the fast decisions. And you can apply Agile methodology within the decision projects that are more the dialogue process to be able to go faster and be more effective in decision making. But I, those methodologies fit into this mindset and need to be aligned so people understand how we go about things. And when you put all that together, you come out with something that I call I Integrated Project Delivery Plus, IPD Plus. That's the organizational congruence, with decision quality and fully aligned execution. Integrated project delivery has a lot of good ideas already, okay? So unified contracts with collaboration, no lawsuits, transparent shared information base that's unified across the project, that this aligning of incentives and sense of ownership and clear line of, line of sight to value, Maybe this is an overlap where the decision quality principles can add a little, but fundamentally the big addition is adding decision quality to reach maximum value potential. From the beginning, embracing uncertainty and being value and risk driven, using decision quality for the shaping decisions to get to maximum value potential, and then having the governance and healthy decision quality culture that goes and guides the decision behaviors and execution. And if you do all that, you have the decision professional support providing true ODQ, that is decision quality embedded from the beginning and throughout. So that's my summary of what we've talked about, and I'll turn it to you, Eric, to how people can develop some of these skills, or if we have time uh, for some of the questions. Yeah, I think we could maybe uh, do a couple quick questions. Uh, I've been monitoring those as they as they come in. 
One is around the, what are the key behaviors? You talked about the difference between aligning incentives and behaviors. Could you identify you know, what do you think are the key behaviors that we need to, to focus on? Well, the, the biggest shift in behaviors, if you got the incentives right, is that people have a common uh, line of sight and know what value is and saying, ask the question, is this in support of creating more value? The, the, the uh, people, there, there are so many biases that, that are apparent in the project world, and most of them become kind of this advocacy attachment. It's my idea, or it's the project idea that we had, or, or some cost, and we've already gone down this road so far, and we can't change. Uh, there are lots and lots of these that, uh, to start solving those, you have to get this common understanding of uh, value. And, and, and the val value is different from a de objectives and destination. Value to me is how much does this generate in additional value to our overall project. And so by the time you get to execution, is if I can save a month, how much is that worth? Okay. So here up comes a little opportunity to, to pre-order, but it costs you something. And the person has to have on their fingertips and saying, oh, if that can save us three weeks on the project, it's worth 10 times what I pay in the as a premium to pre-order. And if we have to cancel the order, it's no big deal, right? That they, they have to be able to make those decisions and have the right behaviors by having that incentives right and then the incentives translated to actionable usable decision guidance okay thank you carl and, and just one more we've seen some pretty big project disasters um over the over the last few years you could blame it on execution uh was the comment here but it could also be maybe it's poor decision making or that it's decision makers wanting to be misled potentially about the costs and the schedule of completing I, I think, these projects? I think uh, when you get overruns and delays and some things like that that are in this 10 to 30 percent and so on, that's usually execution issues or could be. But when you get the massive, we stopped the project because it didn't make any sense or we had a fight among the owners, or we had this, uh, you know, there are lots of things that go wrong with these big projects and the and horror stories abound. Uh, I believe most of those are designed in, in the first two stages of decision making, yes. Okay, good, thank you, Carl, thank you very much. Uh, let's uh, go forward here. If, if you wanna learn more, I wanted to point out uh, just a couple things, and Carl, if you'd go ahead and move forward on the, the slide here. Uh, so at the University of Texas at Austin, uh, through the Macomb School of Business, and in conjunction with SDG, we have a certificate program uh, focused on decision and risk management. And in this program, you take a series of six two-day courses, uh, and there's a listing of upcoming courses here. Uh, some are available asynchronously, been have been recorded uh, others are in person others are live virtual uh, via zoom and, and some are even in, in hybrid mode and carl and i have done a number of these uh, the required courses are decision quality and then leading strategic decision making and you can see the rest of the list come up i just wanted to point out in the handouts that you should be able to access um, through the the online service here there's a brochure for the SDRM program, and then there's also these last three slides if you'd like to download these. Okay, so that, that's a great opportunity. Um, the next is we'll have an, another webinar on uh, November 17th. This will be um, focusing on how to navigate the uh, energy transition, and it'll be presented by the uh, leader of SDG's uh, energy practice, Dr. Sangwon Kim and then uh, another member of the energy practice, uh, Tim Sulser. So please mark your calendar. Uh, I've seen what they're working on. I think this is gonna be uh, quite interesting. Um, 
Okay, so with with that, I just wanted to thank you, Carl, uh, very much. Uh, it's always great to to hear your thoughts and uh, quite thought provoking. And I always take uh, take something away from it. So thank you very much for your time. Bye now. Bye yeah, time. thank you to everybody for uh, for attending. Take All right, care. thank you, thank you both, Eric and Carl, and thank you again, everyone, for attending today's webinar.